Kite surfing is an extremely expensive sport, and outsiders may look at pro athletes thinking that they've got it made. But do they? First place in a World Surfing League event earns $80,000 to $100,000. 64th place in Wimbledon earns $100,000. Can you guess what first place earns in the biggest kiting event in the whole world? The biggest kiteboarding competition in the world. Definitely the Red Bull King of the Air. There's thousands of spectators on the beach and it's in Cape Town. And when it's New King, it's on. What's the prize money for King of the Air? I have no idea. So it's 10K. It's 10K? Mm -hmm. Is that like when you, when you win? Yeah, when you're in first place. So for the people that think we're living our best lives, we're struggling. <laughs> This sport really is quite ridiculous. These kites are basically pieces of fabric stitched together into a wing. Daring kiters pump them up at the beach and tether themselves to the fabric with thin, strong strings, harnessing only the power of the wind and the water. They jump as high as 10-story buildings. Their velocities match a cheetah's sprint as they traverse distances as far as three football fields. With forces like these at play, you can imagine the consequences of the slightest misstep. I think there's probably six or seven guys in the sport, guys and girls, who, who would make what I would call a, a decent living from kiteboarding. And the majority of those people in the sport are either A, losing money, or be doing it on the on the smallest of budgets. Which leagues and comps have you been a part of over your career? <laughs> uh, I think I need like a piece of paper to remember everything. So it started off as the PKRA. That's the one I looked up to when I was a kid and I always wanted to compete on. And I competed on that for a few years until everything kind of went to shit in the sports and yeah. Basically, the company was sold, named the VKWC, which was the Virgin Kite Surfing World Tour. Competed in Dakla, I won the first event of the year. We competed in Morocco. I won the second event of the year. Had various podiums in between all the way towards the end. I think I podiumed on every single event. And yeah, halfway through the year, pretty much, uh, another organization called the IKA got involved. They wanted to take over the tour and take the world title rights away from, from VKWC. And this happened in an event that I chose not to go to because my knee was a little bit injured. Not badly, but I had a little bit of pain. I knew I had a discard that year in the, in the event rules. And basically what happened is they started marketing that I wasn't the world champion because according to their rule, there's no discards. But all of the riders knew that we had clear rules from the start of the year. I basically had to market myself as the world champion without any media helping me at all. I informed like all the newspapers, told all my sponsors to help me, and I created the hype myself. And then it became the WKKL, then it became the WKT. After that, I think the, the industry kind of came in and they finally realized after <laughs> so many years that they need to, to step in and, and take charge of the situation. And I think all of the kite brands came together, they started the GK and they, you know, their idea was to start a sustainable world tour. For me personally, it was really hard because I've always had sponsors within the industry. I've been at the top for so many years and it was always so hard to find support from sponsors because a, a big sponsor would look at the sport from outside and they're like, okay, what are the competitions you're gonna be doing this year? Uh, who are the organizers? And you wouldn't be able to answer the questions because Literally, it was changing every single year. Events were getting canceled the whole time. So yeah, it really had a negative impact on the sport. I know loads of riders that deserve to get support and don't get it yet because kite surfing isn't that big just yet. I think it will be with the effort everybody's putting into it. I mean, Mike, you gotta, you gotta name Mike. Like he's the guy that is pushing so hard for this to be big. And um, it's for me, it's safe to say that if Mike doesn't start all these competitions, I'm not where I am right now. So, and that's just me. There's 20, 30, 40 other competition riders that, that are in exactly the same spot. 
Tell me your name, where you're from, and how old you are. My name is Michael McDonald. I'm 28 years old, and I'm from Cape Town, South Africa. You know, there was a time when we only had two major competitions in the year. I mean, for me, being a, an aspiring big air kiter, there was Red Bull King of the Air and Red Bull Mega Loop. So there's like 25 riders who are getting a chance to compete in international events. And then all these guys who've been inspired by watching these legends going massive in King of the Air over the years, all these guys who are hungry to compete, and we just had nowhere to compete. So, you know, when we, when you take two comps a year and you double it, you got four comps, it's like, wow, all of a sudden magic starts happening. You, you make it six comps in a year, it gets absolutely insane. 11 of the 24 riders in King of the Air 2022 rose to prominence through the ranks of the Big Air Kite League. These athletes showcased their prowess, with two of Backel's top competitors landing spots on the podium and the relentless Lorenzo Cassati capturing the prestigious title. Their journeys are a testament to the idea that regular competition breeds champions a truth vividly brought to life by their stunning performance. How did you get noticed by your sponsors? With a competing competition, like Bigger Cat League at the beginning, because they were like my first competition I was doing. Being a kiteboarder today, also means that you are from uh, not necessarily a wealthy family, but a family with a lot of support towards their kids. Hopefully climb that professional ladder. When you first started kiting, was it difficult to go traveling and getting kites? Was it yeah, hard? yeah. It was super difficult to uh, also travel. My first competition, it was uh, uh, last year here in full power Tarifa. If nobody uh, know you, it's super difficult to have uh, some uh, stuff for free. Yeah, you need to pay everything. And did your family? Support? Yeah, yeah, my, my family helped me a lot. Uh, yeah, and really a lot. Was it difficult for them in the beginning? Uh, it was paid from uh, my family, so yeah. Kiting's expensive, you know, like it's not cheap. Like sometimes I'll go on the site to like order my stuff and I'll be like, check out $16,000. I'll be like, eh, I'm good, I'm happy, I'm not paying for that. I mean, if you want to go all around the world, go to Cape Town when it's good, go to Dahab when it's good, go to Tarifa when it's good, go to Brazil. If you want to go everywhere, then traveling and accommodation is by far the most expensive. Why is it important to travel as a pro kiter? for the wind. <laughs> yeah, because if it's not windy, it doesn't make any sense for me to stay at a place specifically because I'm training bigger, so I need strong wind. So when I am in Tarifa and I see like there's three weeks no wind coming. Last time I went, for example, to Blue Lagoon in Egypt or I went to, to Dakla in Morocco to train. And how much in euros would you guess the average pro kiter makes in a year? So people competing. I mean, right now I think there's a lot of people that don't get paid. So if you take, if you take a writer's fleet, I think there's some guys making maybe 50, 40, 30, 20, but I think there's some guys that still don't make anything. So I think if you take a whole fleet of 18 writers, the average would be around 10, maybe below, because there's a lot of guys that are still funding themselves or have family that fund them. So yeah, it's, uh, it's not the best paid market at the moment. How many riders do you think are actually saving money in the sport? I think there's a select few, eh? Like, I would say a handful of the top guys, you know, and then there's a whole bunch of other guys that are just managing to, you know, scrape through each event, get to the next destination. What are some ways that pro kiters make a living? Sell their bodies. <laughs> other ways to make a living. I think coaching is a big one. Doing clinics uh, is definitely a good way of, uh, of making a living. Some pro kite servers has, have major support from their parents. Some pro kite servers have different sponsors who support them. And some pro kiters really just hustle everything together to, to, to afford everything. Right here you have my couch. This is where the magic happens. Huh? 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Right. Now I think it's really important to have a good online social media presence. That's how we can engage with our sponsors. That's how we can promote the sponsors, and that's how you can make a living with kiteboarding, is sharing that. Do you think people have misconceptions about the lifestyle based on what they see on social media? Well, 100%. Everything on social media is misconceived, you know. Everyone looks at social media and, like, so, so many people come up to me, oh, you live the best life. I mean, it is cool. It's, like, the best. I can't ask for a better life. But there is a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes. You know? Everyone looks at the... Instagram, oh, happy laugh, you know? Growing. I love a great breakfast. Sometimes it, it gets it gets a little bit much. You're like, do I really have to tell people like what I'm doing like every day? And it's like, really, like, do I have to share this? Like, you know, and it's, it's like, uh, sometimes you just don't want to do it, but you know you have to, so you just do. The biggest part of my job, not only to do competitions and push big air, but also social media, pictures, magazines, and all that kind of stuff, which is cool, but also a big down part because I really like to enjoy life and not be on my phone and social media and too busy with those things. It's just not my thing. So basically it, what it takes to go viral on Instagram as a kite surfer is, or you need to go really high, or you need to do something really crazy, or you have to do something really creative. And I think if you have matched one of these three components, the things, the certainty of going viral are pretty big. The kitesurfing technical trick is actually not getting viral. The viral things are, yeah, heel pushing me to the water. <laughs> you know, like something that a not kitesurfer can relate to. What does it mean to be a pro kiter? Being a pro kiter, you have to be creative. You have to be athletic, driven. Um, taking care of your own business mm. and yeah, living the, the nomad travel lifestyle. I think it's pretty awesome. Mentally, this sport is pretty intense, especially doing it as a pro, because the reward we're getting is very little. We kind of get pushed into a corner sometimes that we're doing things that we don't really want to do, but we kind of have to because otherwise, yeah, we're not going to get noticed or we're not going to get that cover shot or we're not going to get that video or podium or everything. Whereas at the same time, we're not really getting rewarded for it enough. So there's a huge like mental fight almost between, hey, fuck, I need to make money. But at the same time, I can't get injured because if I, can't, if I get injured, everything, I lose everything. Like I live a good life. I don't have to worry about money too much, but that's just for being in the present. But if I stop doing what I'm doing now, I can maybe live for another year, but that's it. And that's always in the back of your mind. And yeah, that's, that's something that needs to change, in my opinion, because if you look at the king of the air, there are so many people watching live. There's a lot more than most people think. Live streaming is important because it allows people all over the world to feel like they're a part of the event right then, live, in the action. It gives, it gives riders a lot of exposure. It gives them opportunity to be seen by a lot of people. I'll give you a good example, Beto Gomez. Uh, no one knew Beto. I'd heard of him, you know, from Argentina first. I've been told by Craig Cunningham before about this guy, but didn't know anything. He came to Tatajuba with this amazing energy on the stream and just blew it up. And suddenly, Beto's a superstar. And there's a lot of media and a lot of attention going into that event. And if you see what we get paid to get on the podium is, in my opinion, a bit of a joke. Um, and it's the same for most of the most of the comps. Even right now, the GKA that I'm here for, uh, it's sponsored by Qatar and Porsche and Samsung. Like all the big brands are there. But if you win, you maybe can go home with two two thousand euros, and then you're the world champion going home with two thousand euros, which in my opinion is unacceptable. Is the risk worth it? The risk is worth it, depending at what stage you are in your career. You know, when you're young and you're just trying to make it, for sure you go all out and you'll do whatever it takes to make it to the top. As soon as I, the older I get, the risk becomes less and less worth it. You know, I've got to a certain stage in my career where I've achieved various things. Of course, I want to achieve more, but you kind of start to realize that there's, there's more to life than just kiting and just winning. So, of course, I want to continue to win, but there's certain points where I'm like, I draw the line and I'm like, it's not worth it. What are some changes you'd like to see 
I mean, in the big air kite scene? Yeah, so the main changes I'd like to see in the sport is definitely more support to the riders. I mean, it would be great if other brands can get involved and really set up a team to, to help riders uh, maximize their potential and help them with all, all of the logistics and, and hustle that it takes to become a pro kiteboarder. We need consistency. I think with consistency we can get results, sponsors to get involved. We need money invested. I don't know where that's coming from. Maybe the GKA are the people for that. Maybe this new Qatar deal is going to change the game. Who knows? I guess that's for the future. Surfing is uh, such a way more bigger sport. And in my opinion, like, kite surfing is so much more spectacular. So it's so weird that this sport is still so small. But it's growing. It's growing a lot. And now with Qatar Airways and um, Porsche popping up, I think that's helping a lot. And it's a dream. I mean, I never thought it was possible when I started it. I mean, I've always chased it, always dreamed about it, always wanted it. And now I have it. And first it was that that drive for me to be a professional kiteboarder and don't stop until I am a professional kiteboarder. Now I am a professional kiteboarder. What am I going to do with that? Right? What's the next goal? Thank you for watching Fight for Flight. We're on a mission to blow up this amazing sport and we can't do it without the support of our sponsors. So thank you so much to Core Kites and Makani Beach Club for sponsoring this production. If you like what we're doing and you'd like to be a part of it as a sponsor or a partner or in any other way, we'd love to hear from you. So please send me an email. You'll find my details in the description below. Thanks. Stay tuned for season two of Fight for Flight. We're going to take you on an intimate journey with top athletes as they go to battle in the 2023 Big Air Tour. Above like this, I have to say something. I did the first test loop like four or five years ago in, in Italy, in Sardinia. And, but still, I was nobody, you know, in Catcher Row. So 